Well, as our kiddos head back to Kids Way, I just want to give you a few quick announcements before we get into um, our scripture here this morning. Um, if you haven't been able to fill out one of your commitment cards for next year and you want to be a part of helping our church support ministry financially for next year, you can find these in the binder or on a, a stack in the back table on your way out. Um, you can also uh, sign out a card online. Um, you can see that link in our newsletter. Uh, also, if you're planning to make any other financial gifts throughout the end of the year, especially as tax season draws to a close, uh, make sure you get that in before the calendar year ends so you can count it towards the 2017 tax year. Um, we are still accepting any gifts, especially above and beyond, to help us maintain um, our continuing rise out of our financial deficit caused by all the transitions this year. Um, but as we saw last year, our church is growing and expanding and full of wonderful life. So I don't want you to be discouraged in any way, and we are catching up in a wonderful way on that. So this is a big celebration. We've got to keep pushing because we're almost there. When you walked in, you should have received your GPS here. Um, on the front, you're going to find information about today's message and a place to take notes. We believe God speaks to us in worship, and so we want to listen and remember. So we write down one big thing that God says to us today. On the back, you're going to find scripture readings and prayers for each day throughout the week. Last week, we studied Joseph's story, which came from the Gospel of Matthew. And the GPS for last week had basically Matthew's telling of the Christmas story. This week, we're studying Mary, which comes from Luke, and so you're going to find all the Luke readings here that take us through the Christmas story. So if you track along with this, you're going to read the whole Christmas story told by the gospel writer of Luke, a really wonderful story. So I encourage you to keep engaged with our church family um, through the reading of the word as we go through our week. Chris Krishna is going to come forward at this time and read our story. Uh, this is the story of Mary being visited by the angel. It's kind of a mirror of last week's story about Joseph. Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative, Elizabeth, is in her old age, also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according, let it be with me according to the word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, be, Thanks to God. be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Chris. Friends, let's pray. Holy Lord, we come before you this morning to hear kind of the mere story from last week. We learned about Joseph and his incredible faith to be willing to sacrifice honor, reputation, status, all of these things so important because you called him to do so, to support his wife Mary in the work you were doing. Lord, here, help us to understand Mary's calling. This incredible, strange, overwhelming thing that you asked this very young girl to do and her incredible faith to say yes. Lord, may we understand this person that we seem to know so well, yet have so little information of. May her story come alive in a new way today. Lord, speak to us here today that we may know how to live your life according to your scripture. It's in your name we always pray, God. Amen. So this story of Mary um, 
becoming pregnant, learning that she is going to be pregnant, and that whole experience of it took on a new meaning for me last year because Emma was pregnant during Advent last year. Um, And so I had a very clear understanding of what pregnancy looked like, at least from my perspective, whereas before I had no concept of this. And it began to really explain to me what the season of Advent really was like in a new way. We talk about Advent as this season of waiting, of preparation, of anticipation. We are anticipating the coming of Christ. You hear these songs like, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We are waiting for the coming of Christ. Um, Christ hasn't yet arrived yet. And so as you'll see, even out in our nativity scene in our hallway, um, Jesus is missing. Um, It's not because he's missing. It's because he's not here yet. We're waiting for him to arrive. And I just used to take that for granted. I never really understood what this anxiety, this anticipation, this excited waiting really felt like outside of when I was a little kid just waiting for Christmas to come. And that was pretty short. But pregnancy is long. And I remember sitting there reading Mary's story, and I thought, oh, now I begin to understand this, this emotions that they were going through, this waiting, this preparation, this anticipation, this great excitement of something you know is coming. That's that feeling that we celebrate here during the time of Advent, this preparation, this waiting, this anticipation for this incredible joy. I never felt much connection to Mary and Joseph before Emma got pregnant. I just kind of glossed over it. The Christmas story is what I focused on. The shepherds and the angels and the wise men and the birth and the manger and all these things with which I was so familiar. And the story of Mary and Joseph was just kind of the preamble. It was just the leading up to it. Yeah, okay, the angels visit and then they go and they, you know, you don't get a lot of the story. It just jumps straight to them walking to Bethlehem for the birth of Christ. And I just kind of glossed over it. Until last year, as I was reading the story and trying to prepare a sermon to preach about Mary learning she is going to be pregnant and Joseph learning about this and figuring out how this time works in their life. And as I was living with Emma, I began to think, oh my goodness, I cannot imagine having to walk to Bethlehem next to a nine-month pregnant wife, all right? I don't know how women have the strength to do pregnancy and birth to begin with, but then walking through the desert... To go and be counted for this, the incredible strength of Mary we see on display time and time and time again. I can't imagine that. And so the story we find here is one that's pretty well known, but there are some really interesting things that we find within it. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Now, it's two things important to know in here. The sixth month is in reference to her relative Elizabeth. We think it's her cousin. We don't exactly know, but that's how it's often assumed, that her cousin Elizabeth, whose story is told immediately before this, Elizabeth becomes the mother of John the Baptist. That's who she's pregnant with. So John the Baptist, you'll remember, um, is the one who declares the coming of Christ. His role is to proclaim the Messiah is on his way, that he has come. And people think John the Baptist is the Messiah. And he says, no, the one who comes after me is the true Messiah. And so John the Baptist begins baptizing people and even baptizes Jesus in the River Jordan. They're related. They're probably cousins. They were probably cousins at that time. And so in the beginning of Luke's gospel, we hear this story, this very funny story um, about Zechariah and um, Elizabeth, um, and it's really entertaining. I encourage you to read it. I think it's your first one you're reading for tomorrow in the GPS. Uh, This story is just really funny, how Zechariah finds out um, that that they are going to have a child. He doesn't believe God. He's like, no, 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 no. Lizzie and I are very old. There's no way we're going to have a kid, all right? And, and then God is like, I'll let you read it. It's hilarious. He doesn't get to speak for months. It's really funny. So we get this story coming up to it, and it's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. That's what that means, that we get this story of the angel visiting Mary. Now, Mary is living in Galilee in a town called Nazareth. And what's important to know is that Nazareth was a nowhere place. There's a point in Scripture where Jesus is walking around preaching, and someone starts heckling him when they find he's from Nazareth. And they say, you say you're a great leader, you're from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? They're trash talking where he's from because it was this nowhere place. He wasn't from the capital. He wasn't from a famous city. He was from this nowhere backwoods place, Nazareth. And you're claiming to be this great leader? No. And so we see Mary here in this humble place where Christ is born, where he's from, not where he's born, but where they're from. She is a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph from the house of David, and her name was Mary. And all of a sudden, this angel comes to her. Now, a key difference in the angel visit between Joseph and Mary is that all of this happens for Joseph in a dream. 
And we talked about last week the faith it took for Joseph to wake up from a dream, believe it was really a visit from an angel of the Lord, and to then change his life and sacrifice almost everything he had because of a dream. That's risky. Now, Mary is not visited in a dream. The angel just says an angel visits her. An angel, an angel of the Lord appears to her. It's Gabriel. And I have to wonder, what was that like? You know, how did she react to this strange person showing up? There's nobody else around. Did she freak out? Did she think he's an intruder? I mean, what is this? Imagine some strange winged creature shows up in your room in the middle of the night, right? How are you going to respond? You're probably going to look for like a book to throw at him or something, right? Like, get away from me, stranger danger. Who are you? But she comes, and, and, the, and the angel appears to Mary and says, Greetings, Mary. I bring you good news. You found favor with the Lord. And, and it says that she wasn't sure. You know, she's kind of giving him the side eye. That's, the, that's a paraphrase. But, you know, she's, she's confused and wonders what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel says, You found favor. This is great news. And she's understandably suspicious. And so the angel goes on to say, You're going to bear a child. And it's going to be the son of the most high, the king of David. It's going to sit on this throne. It's going to be incredible, all this wonderful news. And, and Mary says, what are you talking about? This isn't possible. I'm a virgin. I know how kids are made. I mean, Mary was really young, but she knew how this worked. And she said, I, this isn't going to work. What do you mean? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to have this child. And when we read that story, we're so familiar with it, it sounds like great news. In fact, the angels tell the shepherds, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And we read this story and we think, yeah, what a joy, what a blessing that Mary gets to be the mother of the Son of God. What an incredible honor. But I want to stop for a second and think about what this really meant to her and how she probably reacted. She is an unwed woman. She's about to get married, but she's not yet married. And we talked about last week the ramifications of this A woman at this time, if she were not yet married and found to be pregnant, according to Jewish law, she would be eligible to be executed, to be stoned to death. Um, They would drop giant heavy stones on her until she was crushed to death um, with her child along with that. I mean, it would have been a horrific, gruesome death. So this is probably the first thing that goes through her mind. What's going to happen? Even if she is not executed and somehow mercy is extended to her, Joseph is for sure going to leave her. And she's going to have this immense shame. This will define her life and her family forever. And she's thinking, good news. You've just ruined my life. I might be killed for this. What do you mean good news? And I have to imagine Mary walking away from that going, what am I going to do? And we read this story like it's great good news. But to her, this probably felt like scary news, heavy news. What is my life going to be like? And so Mary does what most of us do when we get news that freaks us out. She runs to a loved one, and she goes to visit her relative Elizabeth, and she shows up at her door, and she knocks on the door, and she says, Elizabeth, you're not going to imagine what just happened. I had the craziest night. And it's funny in the story, it's this beautiful story where the baby, which is John the Baptist, inside Elizabeth's belly jumps for joy. And she says, oh, your child's going to be blessed. This is so wonderful, right? Now, I'm sure that that's how it happened because I believe the gospel is true. But I thought to imagine how that story went down today, I would imagine, you know, the mom would be like, oh, baby kick, that's crazy. What? An angel showed up and you're pregnant, holy, magically? Okay, come inside. You know, we got to talk about this. What did you do? What's going on? You have to imagine there's some skepticism. How did Elizabeth respond to this? The funny thing is that kind of buried in the text, there's a note that it says Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. And I have to wonder how many of those three months did it take before Elizabeth really believed her? Because we're skeptical as humans, we are. We're skeptical. Sure, Mary, okay. An angel did it, okay. I read a commentary this week that raised an interesting point. It said, Jesus was born to be a marginal person, someone on the edge of society. He was conceived by Mary when she was unwed, and thus while the birth of Jesus was divinely justified, it was nevertheless socially condemned, even though Joseph stays with her, socially condemned. Jesus, as well as his parents, were marginalized from the very moment of his conception. From the very moment of his conception. This is a sad story when you take this into a historical context. We know the truth of it here sitting today. But when you read the reality of it, it's important to remember that this text, the announcement of the coming of Christ, 
This is the beginning of a story of pain and humiliation for Christ that will lead to Mary's son being condemned to death as a common criminal. Christ is put to death like a common criminal. Ironically, that's the penalty she deserved for being pregnant at this time. But if we think about that, Christ is executed with two common criminals. He's mocked, he's humiliated, he's rejected by the leaders, and his mother has to watch all this. Can you imagine that? Her watching him be rejected, be condemned by the state, be beaten, and then executed. She's there at his death, the text tells us. Mary has incredible faith. But this story is heartbreaking in so many ways when you begin to dig through the layers of really what all is happening here in this story. And when I read this story, I have got to wonder, why did God do it this way? Why? Mary was about to get married to Joseph. If God would have waited, I don't know how long, but probably not very long, weeks, months, maybe days. If God would have just waited until they were married, none of this would have been a problem. Why? Why would God choose to do this? It's not like God's making lemonade out of lemons. God chose when to show up. Why would God do it this way? Why would would he cause so much pain for Mary and Joseph in the midst of this? Why? The reason I think God does it this way is because God has a habit all throughout Scripture of picking the most unexpected, most unlikely people in the most unusual ways to change the world. God comes to the people that are like really not qualified for the job. And he shows up and he asks them to do something miraculous. I'll give you a few examples. God shows up to Noah and says, I want you to build an ark, which sounds crazy, right? He's going to build a giant boat for all the animals, save them from the flood. People thought he was insane. Noah, you need to know, was a drunk. There is a point in scripture where his children have to cover him up because he is drunk and naked laying out in the middle of the day. All right? Noah was not the top of the class, okay? But he's chosen by God to do this incredible work. Moses is on the run for murder from Egypt. He's killed someone, and he is a, he's a fugitive. He's on the run for murder. And God comes to Moses and says, Hey, I need you, you know the place you're wanted for murder? I need you to go back there and walk up to the king, to Pharaoh, and say, uh, I want you to release all of these hundreds of thousands of free laborers you have. Is that cool? No, Moses doesn't want to do that. That story's hilarious. He argues with God. He's like, no, I can't go. I I have a stutter or something. Take my brother. I don't know. I don't want to go. Moses says, no. God says, you. We see this time and time again. David, a man after God's own heart, God's true first king after Saul wrecks a bunch of stuff. Samuel comes to anoint the king of of, uh, Israel. The people want a king, and they pick Saul, and Saul is a bad guy. And Samuel gets this word from God that says, I want you to go and find the right king. So go to this home, and he sees all the sons. The family brings out all the sons, and there's 13 of them. And they go looking one by one from the tallest and the most handsome and the most fierce warrior and the oldest brothers, and no, not him. And they begin to work their way down, and they get all the way to the end, and Samuel says, it's not here. Don't you have another son? He's like, well, I mean, we got like, we have David, but you know, you don't want him. The little runt outside. He's like raking leaves or something. You, you know, hmm, trust me, Samuel. You don't, you know, you want this guy. You don't want, you don't want David. He said, let me see him. So he walks out and he sees this ruddy little kid and he anoints him king of Israel. And David, though he has a lot of flaws, becomes a man after God's own heart, an incredible king. So much so that here in the story of Christ's birth announced, Jesus is said to be in the line of David. That's how significant he was. And yet David was a nobody. Look at the disciples Jesus chose. They weren't these scholars, these rabbis, these incredible religious teachers that we would think if Christ is going to come and get a crew together to change the world, he's going to be looking for the people at the top of their game. But what does he do? He finds these fishermen. Now think about that. Fishermen. All right? Imagine the kind of jokes that fishermen tell. All right? Imagine the kind of language that fishermen use. Imagine the sort of festive drinks that fishermen would drink, right? We think of religious leaders, what do we think of? We don't think of a swearing, drunk fisherman who's out there just trying to make a living. No, we think of these put-together, proper, educated scholars for leaders. That's who we look for. Who did Christ look for? Every day, Joe, nobody on the beach. Come follow me. He got a tax collector. People hated tax collectors. And he said, yeah, come on with me. You can help change the world. Who did he get to write basically all of the New Testament after the Gospels? 
Saul, the guy who was famous for killing Christians. He says, that guy, right? No, why would you pick this guy? God has this trend over and over and over again of picking the most unlikely, unqualified, in the wrong place, at the wrong time people to change the world. And there's a reason I think God does this. There's a text in Acts chapter 17 that says, God is not served by human hands as if God needed anything. God doesn't need us to do these things, but God wants us. God invites us to participate in this transformational work. And God could go and pick the cream of the crop, the top of the class, the smartest person. And that's how it works in our society, right? You have to be successful, good-looking, well-educated, tall if you're going to be a leader. And so the rest of us think, I couldn't do that. I couldn't go be president. I couldn't go be this huge leader, right? I'm just an everyday whatever. And I think the reason God chooses these everyday whatevers is to show all of us, you don't have to be the smartest, from the best family, the most successful. You just have to say yes. I think God chooses these nobodies to do incredible things and change the world to convince all the rest of us it's up to us. We don't get to get out of it because we think, oh, I'll leave that to the, to the leaders. It's us. God comes to each and every one of us. And so I think God shows up to Mary and Joseph, I know, on purpose at this point and says, I'm going to pick somebody from a nowhere place of Nazareth to a nobody, carpenter, to his teenage mother who's unwed, all this shame, all this frustration. I'm going to pick the worst possible scenario and usher in the king of the world, the savior of humankind, so that people will understand I'm here for everyone. Look how I showed up. They expected the opposite. They thought the king of the, the Messiah was going to ride on a white horse as this big king. And here he comes, this carpenter, this lowly man from nowhere, because God uses each and every one of us. It's easy to see the Christmas story here today through kind of rose-colored glasses. Because when we see Mary and Joseph and Jesus, the usual way we see them is in a nativity scene. It's beautiful. Everyone's happy. Mary's got a little makeup on. They're well lit, right? It's silent night, beautiful night. All is calm, right? Okay, I don't know if you've ever like been there for the birth of a child. All is not calm, all right? All is not bright. There is no silent night, all right? We see this, oh, they're in a manger. How beautiful. Y'all, a manger is a horse trough, all right? It would have been dirty, smelly, nasty. There would have been animals out there. It was gross. It was not this silent night, beautiful night in those literal ways. It was a, it was a nasty, smelly, gritty, real people in a real place. But it's hard for us to see that today because these people have almost become caricatures. I read this biography of Abraham Lincoln a few years ago, and um, the intro of it really caught my eye when I think about Mary and Joseph and Jesus. This is about Abraham Lincoln. When a man has become so famous that he is known to everyone, his identity as a person is likely to be lost. His most prominent physical features are emphasized by caricaturists until they come to stand for the man himself. A single adjective describing one phase of his personality is repeated until it takes on the value of a nickname, an honest Abe. All the underlying subtleties and inconsistencies that go to make up the real man are forgotten or suppressed. Finally, he becomes as conventionalized as his memorial statue and with no more insides to him than there is to the bronze casting. No one in American history has suffered more from this process of oversimplification than has Abraham Lincoln. Long familiarity with his name and his appearance has made us feel as if we know this man. His honesty, his kindness, his passion for justice have been described to us ever since we were school children. And all the things that have been said about him are true, but they are not true enough. The Lincoln we have so firmly fixed in our minds is not a person, but a concept. I love Abraham Lincoln. He's my favorite president. But that's so true. He becomes this caricature this top hat engraving we all think we know so well. And I think the same thing happens for Mary and Joseph. We see this nativity scene. We know these stories. And it's easy to just see them in that way. But these were real people. And it makes me wonder about the humanity of them. Uh, Henry, uh, our son, just almost killed me yesterday. Uh, Emma was out of town. And Henry uh, was going for a new house record of crying. 
Um, he got up to four hours yesterday, which was almost the record. Um, and he really just tested my patience. And I was trying to read over my sermon again and get ready for last night's worship as he is just screaming. And I just, there's just no sanity left in my body. And, and I'm sitting there as I'm reading this story. And I just think, I wonder if this ever happened to Mary and Joseph. Like, I wonder if Jesus was ever just like screaming as a baby for four hours. And she was just like, what am I going to do? What are you doing? Why, I, how, how am I going to survive? Who are you? You're God. Okay, I guess you get a pass, right? Like, I mean, what is that like? Was Jesus like a crazy screaming baby? I remember when we bathed him for the first time. Henry, we have a photo of this. Um, I wanted to put a fun mus- a mohawk on him. Um, he was not pleased when I did that. Um, but I have to wonder, like, when Mary and Joseph gave Jesus his first bath, did they give him a mohawk? I don't know, but I like to think about it. These are real people who lived real lives. They aren't these caricatures we see in the nativity scenes. And we see this, and we learn Mary's story, and we see her incredible faith, her incredible strength to say yes to this overwhelming thing that means she should be put to death, shamed, left, abandoned, embarrassed. And even when all this comes to pass and she makes it through all those moments, she still has to watch her son suffer and die publicly. Mary's faith and strength is incredible. She is such an inspiring person. There's one thing I want to make sure we don't do. There are a lot of traditions that have, um, in essence, deified Mary. Um, She is held up as the perfect woman to be followed. All women should be like Mary. And it's beautiful to have role models, and it's wonderful to have people in Scripture to look towards and model our life after. But Mary is a tricky one, because Mary is known for two primary things, for being a virgin and for being a mother. And outside of adoption, you can't pull that trick off, right? She needed the Holy Spirit to make it happen. And so we pattern this as the model for women. Women must be chaste, they must be virgins, but they also must be mothers, And we have this impossible reality for women to live up to. And it's rooted in scripture and canonized and put into religious dogma. And it has hurt and oppressed women for centuries. And so we can go too far when we see a woman like Mary, a character in scripture. We can take it too far. One of the things I think it's important to see when we look at Mary is not to relive her story, not to hold our expectations to what Mary's life was, but to see her faith and to be inspired by what she did, which was to say yes when God asked. She didn't apply for this job. She wasn't qualified for it. Nobody was. But God approached her and said, I've got something for you to do, and it's huge, and it's scary, and it's going to cost you a lot, but it's going to change the world. And it says that she said, yes, here I am, a servant of the Lord, Mary replies. And Mary says, yes. I think when we read the story of Mary, we are to be inspired by her faith, to strive to be willing to say yes when God asks us to do these incredible things that feel impossible because God does ask us. And none of us are exempt because God picks the most unlikely, unqualified people and all of us are eligible for that. Mary's incredible faith is displayed when she says yes and she follows what God has for her. And I think that's a beautiful thing for us to ponder this year as we draw to a close and celebrate this Advent season, what is God asking each one of us to do? And how can we say yes to help transform the world? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you seeking to have faith like Mary. We read the story of this incredible woman who is often taken for granted as a background character, and yet we all know her name. Lord, her faith is unbelievable that she was willing to say yes to all that this was going to cost her blows our mind. Lord, you don't come to us and ask us to bear the Son of God, but you do come to each and every one of us with a specific calling. And every one of those callings requires work and sacrifice to pour our heart and soul into it. And it's very hard. But Lord, we want to say yes. We want to be like Mary. So encourage us. Open our ears that we may hear not just the busyness of all the parties we have to plan and the family events this season, but that we may be listening for you, for you to come interrupt our lives, to invite us on a journey that changes the world. 
Lord, help us not to forget you. Help us not to get so busy during this Christmas season we forget. We forget to pray and to ask where you're leading us. Lord, we thank you for Mary, for her incredible faith, the way she inspires us. May we have the same faith to say yes, to go where you lead, to help serve you in any way we can. Lord, this is a huge thing, and we need your help, for we can surely not do it alone. And so we pray to you in times of strength and great weakness, this prayer that you taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.